All right, welcome back to our exciting End Times Conference with Joel Richardson. Uh, we are super glad you're watching this, and for those of you that are here, we're very excited that you have been with us for all of these sessions. It's been a really fun day. It's long, a long day, exhausting day for Joel, so uh, we're just so appreciative that he's uh, doing this. So. Uh, we always just do this really quick. If you don't know anything about our ministry, you can go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, if you want Joel's uh, ministry, it's joelstrumpet.com. Uh, you need to go on there, find out all the stuff that he's talking about. Um, we like to say this, this is session six. So please, please go back to session one and start from one and work your way through because it will give you the whole picture. And so now we're going to move into talking about uh, something really exciting, the thousand-year millennial reign. So, Joel... All right. So the um, the issue of the millennium is it's really challenging, and it's very very rarely discussed, um, and yet it's a very important biblical concept and doctrine. But you'll almost never really hear a pastor, you know, talk about it in, in much detail. Now, what's interesting is, um, how many have ever read the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn? It's quite a few. It's a great book. How many loved the book, you know, like, and, but it's just called Heaven. Um, there's not many other books that really address the nature of the afterlife if you will, what happens after we die, what is heaven really like, and he uses the term heaven. Heaven is not necessarily the best term. It's what most people relate to. It's really not even that biblical, to be honest with you, like someday we go to heaven forever. It's, it's actually not that biblical. Um, in the late 1800s, there were several books that were written on just the issue of the millennium, the kingdom. The kingdom is a much more biblical term, actually. Um, but there is a lot of confusion because people don't talk about it a lot. And this is not a real technical theological discussion at all. In fact, I'm going to repeat some of the things here that, um, that we've talked about in, in some of the other sessions. Um, you know, there's a lot of verses that come up again. But essentially, let me just say this. Um, you have a biblical worldview, a worldview that is framed by the Bible, that's defined by the Bible. But at the same time, in the first century, as the New Testament was being written, you also had the influence of the Greek philosophical world. And these two worldviews were sort of in conflict. So, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things. But the, the biblical worldview essentially is this. Well, let me start with the Greek, the Greek worldview. The Greek worldview kind of says this, is that you have earth down here, and then you have the spirit realm up there. And the goal of spirituality is to escape down here and to escape the shell of, of skin and flesh and to attain pure spirit, to ascend up into the spiritual realms and there's kind of tears and, and so forth. That's the Greek philosophical worldview. The biblical worldview is that Wait, let me just see. You guys are this way. Yeah, so the biblical worldview is that you have this age. This age is corrupt. This age is wicked. It's fallen. And then you have the age to come. We are looking, we're not so much wanting to go up to heaven. We're looking forward to the future age to come. And that is the age of restoration, the renewal of all things, the restoration of the Garden of Eden, the restoration of the glorified kingdom of Israel, again, mixed together with the Garden of Eden, something far more, you know, greater. But that's really how the Bible kind of describes it, this agrarian utopia, this kingdom with the Messiah ruling and reigning on the throne. And it's not so much about going up. Now, what's a little bit confusing is that the Greek worldview has some elements of truth. If we were to die today, our spirits would be with him in heaven. So you've got, but now here's the thing. Now, this is, I'm going to kind of throw you. According to the biblical worldview, well, let me do this again, just to contrast it. The Greek worldview says that this is the 
physical, earthly realm. The heavens are spiritual. That's non cop how do you say non corporal? Wait, cor cor corporeal. <laughs> Sometimes I get up here and get stage dumbness or whatever. Um, it's non physical. <clears throat> um, from a biblical worldview, the earth is physical and spiritual. The heavens are f spiritual and physical. They're both physical and spiritual. The earth is physical and spiritual. The heavens are also physical and spiritual. There's stuff up there. There's noises. There's things. There's, you know, it's not the place of ghosts. Now, if we were to die today, we would go to be with Jesus. But even those that are with him are awaiting the day of the Lord and the physical resurrection of the dead and the renewal of all things. Now, he didn't just come to save our souls. He came to save our bodies, to redeem physical. He, and, but he also came not just to redeem us, but all of creation. Things in heaven and on earth. According to the Bible, the heavens are actually fallen as well. There are fallen watchers, principalities. It's not just that man has fallen. There's an element of fallenness even in the heavens. And in Jesus, all of these things will, heaven and earth essentially become one, and they are all healed and restored back to their original state. So, you know, it's, it's actually, you start going, wait a minute, that's, that is what the Bible teaches. You know, you go through all the scriptures, and you're like, but I've just always thought of it in more of a Greek way. Someday I die and go to heaven forever and kind of become a ghost. Um, become a spirit, you know, or, you know, we'll, we'll vaguely recognize those that went before, you know, it's kind of, and then there's kind of elements that seem physical, but really we're awaiting the age to come. Okay, now the age to come is divided up between the millennium, which is the thousand year reign of Jesus, and then is the, the final state of things, which is called the new heavens and the new earth. So, this was, so you have this age and the age to come, but the age to come has the thousand-year reign of Christ, and that really is a transitionary period. Now, what is the basis for the millennium? It's, a lot of people will say, well, it's in Revelation 19.20, it gets up there and it starts talking about the millennium, the thousand years. That's not the only place that talks, that's just the only place where it specifies a thousand years. But you have all these passages in the Old Testament, we're not going to get into them now because that's not the point, I'm kind of just doing a little preliminary. You have all these passages in the Old Testament that talk about an age that is not perfect, but it's definitely better than this age. Isaiah 25 is an example. It's like death is swallowed up. I mean, you've got passages, you know, like the lion will lay down with the lamb and the kid will put his hand into the cobra's hole and it says, you know, someone will, if they die at 100, it'll be like they died as a young child, but yet there's still death. Things aren't perfect yet, but so there's many, many passages that you can point to say, well, that's talking about the millennium because it's better than this current age, but yet it's not perfect yet. And then there is the new heavens and the new earth. And, and the millennium, in a lot of ways, is a transitional stage. And so we're going to talk about the millennium, but what's also interesting is that there are some passages, they look forward, and it's almost like they kind of mix the two, the new heavens and the new earth, and the millennium. It's almost like they mix them together a little bit. And that drives us as Westerners crazy, because we want to dissect the Bible into these neat categories and things. And sometimes they're just generally talking about the age to come, and it kind of bleeds together. And you go, well, how do you know that it it's doesn't just bleed together? Because there are clear other passages that are, are distinct, if that makes sense. So I know it was a little technical. I called this, um, this session uh, our anchor of hope. And the first passage I want to look at is... Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. I love this. I love, there's so many great nuggets in the book of Hebrews. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to us, the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. So he's getting technical. He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant, making these promises, how God confirmed it. We talked about that earlier, cutting the animals up and everything. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So he's just reiterating, God made promises, God will keep his promises. And then it says this, it's talking about us. 
And I love this phrase. It's an unusual phrase. It refers to us as we who have fled. We who have fled. What have we fled from? We have fled from this wicked current system, this age. We haven't fled from this planet. The end times are not the end of this planet. The end times are the renewal of the planet. The end times are not the end of the world. The end times are the end, as I said, of corrupt politicians, of human trafficking, of exploitation, of preliminary, early, you know, juvenile diabetes and cancer and sickness and aging, and you know, just all of the things of this age. It's the end of those things. It's the end of sin. It's the end of fentanyl overdose. It's the end of addiction to three bowls of Captain Crunch before you go to bed. Whatever it is that you're addicted to. Like, we all have our thing. It's the end of all of it. Or the, whatever, the muffins. I'm kind of doing all this guilt stuff, so I notice the muffins aren't quite moving as fast. I'm just kidding. I hear them calling me, though, the whole time. Um, we who have fled. What have we fled? We, we know what we fled from, but we have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us Everything we've been talking about mostly today is our hope, our hope, our expectations, what we're looking for. And it says that we to lay hold of this hope that's offered to us so that we will be greatly encouraged. As soon as we leave here, the whole system is structured to discourage us. Every, the messaging of the world, the messaging of Satan, the messaging of the principalities, the messaging of our friends, our family, you name it, literal messages on billboards, this world is going to discourage us. We get together for the purpose of encouraging one another. And so that's a big part of why we gather together regularly. And it says, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure, So this hope, this coming restoration, this coming renewal, this coming renewal of all things, that is the anchor that is going to get us through the storms, the thing that has us firm and secure. We hold on to that. We cling to it. However, in my opinion, in church, we don't ever hardly talk about it. It's just this vague, someday you don't go to hell. Like, that's good. Please elaborate. And I'm convinced that we should elaborate a lot more. We should get lost in discussing the things in Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven. We should talk about the nature of the age to come. The prophets talk about it like crazy. Why don't we talk about it more? Because that's the source of our encouragement. That's what we're supposed to encourage one another with. Let's talk about those things. Amen? So first of all, the kingdom that's coming is fundamentally at its core. It's the kingdom of justice. (coughs) I've touched on this already. Isaiah 9, verse 7. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over his kingdom. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This current age is defined by injustice. Every day there's a new injustice. It doesn't matter who you are, what, um, you know, group your part of this. There is something out there that feels profoundly unjust. We have this hope, this confidence that the day is coming, the age is coming when the world will be filled with justice and righteousness. That's the essence of his kingdom. Again, I touched on some of these things, I believe earlier, Isaiah 11 verse 4. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor. He will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Who is the gospel for? It's for the poor in spirit, right? Not just that you're broke. I mean, that's part of it. (laughs) That's part of being poor, but it's for the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, the afflicted, the downtrodden. Micah 4, verse 6, In that day declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, those that can't walk, those that can't talk, those that are rejected, the marginalized. I will gather them. Those will be the ones that will be lifted up and exalted in that day. Isaiah 29, verse 19, the afflicted will increase their gladness in the Lord. The needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 35, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. I love that. If you've ever had gardens, you know that's eight feet tall. You know, they will get in. If your fence is not eight feet tall, they, the lame, they will get up out of their wheelchairs and leap like a deer. I love this, the mute tongue, 
formerly that could not talk, will shout for joy. It's the sick, the afflicted, the lame, the marginalized, the hated. Zephaniah 3.19, I will save the lame. I will gather those who were driven out and I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were formerly put to shame. Psalm 72.13, he will have compassion on the poor and the needy, the lives of the needy he will save. Ezekiel 34, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered. I will bind up the broken. I will strengthen the sick. On the other hand, the fat and the strong, I will destroy and feed them to the judgment. So what that means is that if you are overweight or if you go upstairs and lift weights, no, that's not what it means. <laughs> if you're up there pumping iron, you're doomed. Um, it's, it's talking about the fat cats, right? Those that become wealthy and rich at the expense of those that they've exploited. It's not if you're overweight or in shape, because otherwise we're all doomed, basically, the bottom line. Um, and I will feed them with judgment. It's those that are self-strong in, in and of themselves, the fat cats, again. The idea back then, you know, like my friend, it's interesting, he, um, he, he works in Uganda, and he said, you know, in, in Africa, it's, if you're fat, that's considered blessed. And he goes, I, came, I was in the States and I came back and my friends were all like, oh, Chad, you got so fat, brother. And he's like, what? And they're like complimenting him, like, you're doing good, man. And he's like, you know, ashamed. But even in biblical times, that's the idea is like, if you got heavy, it, that, the idea was you must be wealthy. You know what I mean? Like, so it's basically saying those that are, and the assumption of your wealthy is you're doing it on the, pa on the backs of the poor. That's kind of the idea. But anyway, no judgment if you're in shape or whatever. Isaiah 2, verse 11, 13. The eyes, so, okay, so conversely, it's for the poor, the needy, the afflicted. On the other hand, it's also the time of judgment. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled. The pride of men will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store. All the proud and lofty, those that lift themselves up, all that is exalted, they will be humbled. Okay, so the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the essence of that day, the essence of that age is the age of justice. So I've got a little diagram. And you, have, you get a handful of passages where Jesus, Paul, and Peter, they all say something along these lines. They go, look, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like the pagans, for they lord it over one another. He goes, no, but you, it's not going to be that way with you. For you, the greatest among you will be your servant, and the servant will be the greatest. So basically, Philippians 2 says this. He goes, have in yourselves this attitude. And this is an amazing, amazing passage. Have in yourselves, let's all have ourselves this attitude, of, of the attitude of Christ, who although he existed in the form of God Almighty, the one who like, you know, spoke and the universe came into existence, although he's the one that made everything, he didn't consider equality with God something to be seized and held on to. No, rather he took on flesh and he became a servant, even to the point of being mutilated and tortured to death on a cross. He made himself a servant. Think about that. He chose to put himself at the bottom of the pyramid. And then he says to us, have in yourselves that same attitude. That's intense. Choose to put yourself at the back of the line. Choose to make yourself a servant of others. Now, every position of authority throughout the earth, every position of authority is ordained by God to be a position of servant leadership. Every, every single position. I don't care if it's you know, being a pastor of a church, running the local tire manufacturing plant, being the NFL commissioner, whatever it is, politicians, they are servants of the people. We're called to serve those that we're in leadership over. But most often, people go the way of the world. They claw their way to the top. They exploit those under them, you know, this and that. They, 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 everyone's working to get to the top. Now, with that said, I would like to discuss a fantastic opportunity that I have. <laughs> Some people are starting to get the joke. Have any of you considered the lucrative career of selling essential oils or doing Amway. No, I'm just kidding. Um, just joking. But the way of the world is everyone's putting themselves at the top of the pyramid. The way of Jesus is he puts himself at the bottom and he says, and all of you do likewise. The day of the Lord, go to the next slide, is the great reversal. Those that put themselves at the top will be humbled, 
humiliated and or cast into the lake of fire. Those that were humble servants will be lifted up. Jesus, who made himself a servant, will be the exalted king. And those who were um, chose to imitate him will also come. You who have been faithful over little, take charge over ten cities. Right? So this is the great reversal. Uh, it's just a term that I made up. But it, the day of justice is everything in this age doesn't make sense. Not everything, but like a lot of it doesn't make sense. It's unjust. It's backwards. The day is coming when the humble and the meek. And look, in the age to come, there's going to be a lot of great people that will be nobodies. And there's a lot of nobodies that will be great. And a lot of people that will be famous down through history might not even make it. And then people that no one knew will be leaders because his ways are not our ways, right? So that's, it's beautiful. It's actually a beautiful thing, particularly for the poor in spirit. There will be an entirely new global leadership structure. This is basic stuff, but this is exciting. Again, you know, in Missouri, how many people have ever spent any time in Missouri or Kansas or just the Midwest? Every seven years, we have these things. They crawl up out of the ground and they cling to the trees and then they shed their shell and then they go up in the trees and for months they go, right? You know, cicadas and there's thousands of them. It's crazy. When I moved out there, I was like, what in the world is this? These little things, they fly around, they're idiots. Like, like the dogs are eating them. Like they just, like they're just the weirdest things, right? But we also have this thing that happens throughout the whole country every four years. It's called an election season. <laughs> it's the worst. And there's these commercials, and they're like, so and so. Like, and it's just, oh, like, I just hate it. I know some people feed off of it. The time is coming when the Lord is going to put an end to election seasons. <laughs> and he's going to put an end to corrupt politicians. And it's not all politicians, but it's, a, it's a, again, I'm going to say a high percentage, right? These are supposed to be, posi- and they vote, you know, get in and vote themselves for, you know, higher pay raises, you know, to term, no term limits, this, that, and the other thing. And then they get out 30 years later and they are multi-millionaires serving the people. And unfortunately, we see it in ministry as well. We see pastors doing the same thing. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Jesus is coming back to kill dictators to kill those that exploit them that they're intended to serve he will judge the nations heaping up the dead crushing the rulers of the whole earth then there it is luke 19 verse 17 next slide well done my good servant the master replied because you have been trustworthy faithful in a very small thing take charge of 10 cities in the millennium the world will be governed by true those that prove themselves in this age to be humble servant leaders. There will be an entirely new global leadership structure under Jesus. There's actually, take charge over 10 cities. Why? In heaven, we don't have cities. There is just, no. Like, there's cities that will be governing, and our job is to actually rule and reign with Jesus. That's what we're called to do. Um, You know, there's a lot of questions. Well, how many people? And I don't really want to control 10 cities. So, you know, like, do I get to do what I want to do? I would argue yes. There will be no more wars. Um, you know, I've mentioned a few times, I'm politically very conservative. Um, I'll never forget 9-11 happened, and, uh, you know, nobody can forget that. But I'll never forget the day that George W. Bush, um, you know, who I voted for, was standing there on the rubble with all the firefighters and the captain in his little kind of Izod members-only jacket or whatever, you know, the humble jacket and he's got the megaphone and and he's got his arm around the fire chief and and he's trying to say a few things and someone yells I can't hear you and he responded really well which he didn't always do which was always fun for the late night comedians but he took the thing and he goes I can hear you I and the whole world can hear you and he said and the people that brought these buildings down are going to hear from all of us real soon and pretty much the whole country stood up and cheered do something, do anything, bomb somebody. It was kind of the attitude, make them pay. It was fresh, the, the, but I stood, I was like, yes. And I cheered for the invasion of Iraq, right? And then here I was, 2015, 
five years ago, standing in northern Iraq, preaching to an Arab church, looking into the face of my Arab brothers and sisters, evangelicals, largest Arab church in northern Iraq, and I'm like, guys, I cheered for what would be the destruction of your country and most of your lives being devastated. Like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm doing everything I can. To, and we meant well, don't get me wrong, but the point is this. The Bible says there is a time for war, and I would argue that there is a time for war, but quite frequently in this age, it's not time for war. Oftentimes, it's not. And, you know, we lost... Since then, we've lost, I don't know, 4,000 plus men and women in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and both countries, I mean, arguably, Iraq is way worse. But, the, you know, we couldn't have, you know, I'm not, this is not an indictment of anybody or anything. But we've got tens of thousands of men and women, um, you know, veterans with prosthetic limbs and traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress syndrome and the suicide rates are through the roof. By and large, guys, war is not something we ever should root for. But the day is coming. It's a good thing that the day is coming when there will be no more wars. Again, in this age, there is a time for war. In, in an age of evil, there's time that it's necessary. But it's never a good thing. It's never a good thing. First verse, Isaiah 2, verse 2 through 4. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares. No longer war, now it's about farming. And there's spears into pruning hooks for fruit. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. All of the karate dojos will shut down. That's a joke. <laughs> we will rebuild the earth. How many people would like to be part of Jesus' kingdom architectural planning committee? How many people would love, how many people would love to quit their job and work for Jesus rebuilding stuff, right? Like that, like that resonates with us. That, we get excited. Why? It's very simple. Because we were created by our creator in his image, which means we are creative people. First thing little kids do, right? They get out the crayons. They start scribbling. They start creating. They start make. We love to make stuff because we were made in his image, the image of our creator. And, and you know, Creating, building, growing, all of these things, it resonates with us because we were made to do these things. We, we were made to work, not just not work for the man, right? Not work for some egomaniac or whatever. Isaiah 61, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. I know not all bosses are egomaniacs, but <laughs> sometimes. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations. This is talking about the millennium. It's not talking about now. People will quote this, you know, politi politicians always quote this. Um, it's a good principle, you know, to, to be about um, healing society and doing, you know, it's about, because we, what we do now is modeling the nature of the age to come. But ultimately, we're not going to fix everything in this age. We, we do our best day to day. We do our best, but he's the one that's coming back to genuinely restore all things. There will be fishing as I said, my father's a commercial fisherman. I grew up fishing. He's, um, he's dying of Alzheimer's. He's sunsetting. He's, he still has some there, but he's going blind. And, you know, it's just, it's hard. He's in the cold. He he's, can't go fishing. No one will take him anymore. And, and, you know, I've talked to him about this, but I found some verses. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. Like, this is not just like I found verses because I wanted to. Like, they're really there. And I told him about this, and I was, oh, let me read the verse first. So the scriptures say that after Jesus returns, after the Mount of Olives splits, there's some, there's some uh, topographical changes in Jerusalem. And it talks about a river that will then begin flowing from out of the temple, and it will go down that great rift valley, down Jerus you know, south of the Kidron Valley, and it will go down to the Dead Sea. And it's this, this river will start gushing forward. And it says it will actually make the Dead Sea alive. It will heal it. I don't know if it'll be salt water or fresh water, because it says fresh, but what it really means is healed. So it says this, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish, because this water flows there and makes the salt water healed. 
and that's the Dead Sea, will be healed fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Edglaim, and there will be places for the spreading of fishermen's nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean. So I'm going to assume that this is not, by the way, catch and release. <laughs> I'm going to assume they are catching fish for the purpose of eating. Because again, I moved out from Cape Cod, the Atlantic, to Kansas City, and we have catfish. Like, I don't trust seafood in Kansas City. Where'd this come from? You know? That's why I said I trust barbecue. And barbecue, yeah, anyway, it's a Kansas City thing. But, I mean, it's, it's a glorious Kansas City thing. But I was talking to this... Um, <laughs> I was talking, again, I, was, I painted for 20 years, and I was talking to this good old boy from Missouri, and he goes, uh, he goes, I catch and release in the hot grease. <laughs> so I was like, good, that's, that's, that captures. I catch catfish that taste like mud, and I dip them in cornbread and deep fry them. It's good stuff. I'm like, yeah, it tastes like deep fried mud. Have you ever seen the show where they stick their hand in the holes and catch yeah. catfish? Yeah. Out in Missouri, if you want to join the gangs, that's what you got to do. You got to go out and drink a six pack, stick your hand in a muddy hole, and then you get to be part of it. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I'm picking on us. I, it's a glorious redneck place to live. But the, the point is, in the age to come, there will be fishing. Like, why do I talk about this? Maybe you're not into fishing. There is, life goes on. After we die, after we are buried in the ground, we come back from the dead, and there's actually stuff that we do, like fishing, singing, gardening, building. Now, here's where it gets weird. Kind of weird, a little confusing. We, who are believers, those of us, we will be resurrected when he returns. There will be a multitude of people who will live, who are not believers, who will live through his return, and enter the millennium in their natural bodies. There will be people on the earth in their natural bodies, just like this, still getting old, aging, but the natural order will be changed so that they will live much longer. There will be people born in their natural bodies, and how exactly we will live with them in our glorified resurrect is I don't know exactly how that's going to work. But in the same way that Jesus came back and sat down and ate fish with his disciples, there's a degree to where it seems as though we will interact with them. But the Bible doesn't really get into great detail in terms of how that's going to work, and I don't know. But the scriptures are clear. Many will enter the millennium in their natural bodies, and also there will be many who are previous believers who will be resurrected when he returns. But for all of us, there is, you know, we don't just, because we're in our resurrected bodies, we don't just kind of like, hover above the earth or like we will actually be part of what's going on there will be gardening and vineyards um, this is again fun stuff amos 9 9 through 15 behold the days are coming declares the lord when the plowman will overtake the reaper in other words spring is here it's time to plow the fields and we haven't even finished harvesting because there was so much so much to harvest the treader of grapes those that are that are stomping the grapes, it's time to sow the seeds and you haven't even done squishing them all yet. You know, the harvest will be so great, the mountains will drip with sweet wine. How many winos in the room? <laughs> and all the hills will be dissolved. I will, and that's talking about the nations. <laughs> I will restore the captivity of my people. They will rebuild the ancient cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards, they will drink the wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them in their land, and they will not again be rooted out from the land which I have given them, says the Lord their God. Micah 4, verse 2 through 4. Again, they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They won't train for war anymore. Now, this is neat. Every man will sit under his own vine in his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. So this verse is for the introverts. <laughs> I have uh, five kids, and people go, well, when do you write books? I go, I get up at four in the morning. If I don't get up at four in the morning, there's no quiet time. Uh, I mean, there is kind of, they go to school. But really, if I want quiet time, that, like, it just gets loud. Once they get up, it gets loud fast. And the rest of the day, it's just loud. I have a loud family. If I want quiet time, it has to be very early in the morning. So you know that 
time when you sit out on the patio with your cup of coffee and it's just good morning lord it's just us you know it's it's just like that's oh yes like i don't get much of that i'm sorry for the slurping i was trying to do a rush limbaugh um he always slurps into the microphone real loud um Every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree. Lord, I didn't know that after I die, I get a vine and a fig tree. You know, it's like, what was the old promise of president? What is it? A Something, a chicken in every pot. That sounds good, but I like the vine and the fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the Lord Almighty. Now, similarly, but all alternatively, Zechariah 3, 9 through 11 says, I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. In that day, this one's for the extroverts. Each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree. What are you guys doing tonight? Come on over. Have you seen my figs? This is crazy. You guys are great. Have you tried my wine? <laughs> you know. So it's like a little bit of something for everyone, declares the Lord Almighty. How many people really just, you know what I mean? Like you love working in your garden. Like what kind of gardens out here in Phoenix? You get pretty much anything, but you know what I mean? Like tomatoes, like, you know, there's the book, like, what is it? Like the $80 tomato, the idea, you know, like, ooh, nothing tastes as good as mm, the tomatoes that I grew. And then you calculate all the money that you put into the garden and it ends up being like $80 per tomato, but it's the juiciest. It's the juiciest tomato, but we love it because we partnered with the Lord to make it happen. We started with a little seed. We grew it. Oh, this, this salad is from my vegetables that I grew. Like there's just something there that we all get excited about. Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. Now we're getting into some more kind of specifics. We've looked at some of this stuff already. Actually, I'm not going to read this one. Is 2 Samuel. That's the Davidic covenant. The Lord declares to David, he says, on your throne, David, someone's coming forth. He's going to rule on your throne. That's literal. It's not some metaphorical, allegorical passage. He says, David, your kingdom is going to last forever. And the Messiah is the one. The Messiah, when the the kingdom seemed like it was all over and done, and out of that stump will come forth a shoot. And he's a descendant of David. Jesus is coming back to rule on the throne of his father David, on the throne of the the royal Jewish Davidic dynasty in Jerusalem. I mean, you know, there's very specific, um, again, geography to all of this. This There's very specific history to all of this. Isaiah 9, again, we've looked at this passage a few times. A child will be born to us, a son will be given, skipping forward, on the throne of his father David. Uh, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying rule in the midst of your enemies. Again, this theme is repeated multiple, multiple times. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16, in those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell in safety. This is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The restoration of the kingdom to Israel. I guess I actually touched on some of this. Let me skip forward here a little bit. Yeah, I've actually read some of these verses. Let me just say this. You've actually got references. I'll get into some of the strange stuff. You've actually got very clear verses. I won't, because all the verses here we've actually read and kind of gone over. And forgive me. But um, you've actually got verses that say the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem during the millennium. You go, well, wait a minute. As evangelicals, the sacrifice of Christ was once and for all. Yes, there, you know, there, that was the once and for all sacrifice, but not all of the temple sacrifices are for atonement for sin. There's actually, that's, there's really no sacrifices that are atoned for sin. There is none. The majority of all the sacrifices have to do with ritual purity and all these different things. And we won't get into the details in terms of why there will be a temple, but Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 give a lot of incredible detail. It's basically a blueprint for this millennial temple that will be rebuilt and there'll be sacrifices um, in Jerusalem. And the reason I'm saying this is not to confuse you, to 
bring up new questions, but to say it clearly talks about sacrifices in Jerusalem, which means this. You know what it's like when you drive down your street and you reel down the window and you go, <laughs> Merv is grilling. Or someone, so one of the neighbors is grilling. You're like, ooh, someone's grilling. We will experience the fragrances of the meats. <laughs> I call it potpourri for men. Um, but, the fr- you know what I mean? The smell of barbecue. Like, you know, like the, the, the power fragrances. I grew up in Massachusetts, the fall leaves. When I go back there now, 30 years later, it almost makes me cry. It's just the smell. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the smell of my childhood playing out in the leaves. But you, we don't have the same smell in Kansas. It's, the leaves are different. You know what I mean? These kind of things, the smell of the barbecue. But it's not just that. There's also the incense. The divinely, the ingredients of the incense that the Lord lays out there, it will be offered up. And they, they offer up a lot of it. So there's, there's the meat for the carnivores and there's the incense for the hippies. There's, again, there's something for everybody. And there's the sound of the choirs in the temple. When you read about David when he built the temple, he paid the equivalent of millions of dollars a year to pay for singers to full-time be in the temple singing at all times. And in the age to come, it will be the same thing. The temple will be filled with worship. We will hear the sound of the millennial singers, Jesus present in Jerusalem, the fragrance of the meats, the fragrance of the incense, the sounds of Jerusalem there in the city, a very real place. You know, like just to try to picture all that, the picture that the prophets paint, it's much different than just someday I get to be a ghost forever. There's just this substance, there's meat, there's texture to it. There's, it's, there's a, a brilliant technicolor picture that the prophets paint, and we almost never talk about it. And yet the book of Hebrews says, guys, this is the anchor of hope for our souls. As the days ahead get difficult, if we should live to be there during the birth pains, as, as darkness covers the earth, as you know the, the birth pains, the natural disasters, the earthquakes, the, if we live through that, the, the meltdown of the economy, whatever it might be, just the normal storms of life, if we want to get through them, wouldn't it be so much better to get through them if we hold on to the anchor of hope? The Lord has given us this anchor of hope. He's given us all, and yet we hardly ever discuss it. I'm of the opinion that we should meditate upon it, think about it, gather together, encourage one another much more often, peer into the prophets and get excited because that's our inheritance. That's what we're looking forward to. After we die, after we're buried in the ground, unless Jesus returns first, after all of that, then all of this stuff is, our, is as real as this moment right now is real. It's a crazy thing. It really is a crazy thing um, to think that he's going to raise us up out of the dead. But he who promised is faithful. Amen. He who promised is faithful. He's never, everything that he said is yes and amen. You know, throughout history, the things that he says, he always does. And even the crazy stuff, you know, the stuff that's hard to believe, I say the crazy stuff, resurrection from the dead, it's a, it's a, it's a, when you really think about it, it's a tough thing to believe. The day is coming when we'll be raised up out of our graves and we will be caught up to meet him in the air if he doesn't come back first. And then we will taste and see and experience the beauties and the glories of the renewed earth. We will see him on the throne in Jerusalem. So amen, amen. and amen. amen. Oh. I'm sorry. What about relationships? How how will relationships? Um, yeah. So, how will they work? That's a little bit complicated, because it does say that in heaven will neither be given in marriage or you know that type of thing. Randy Alcorn does a great job in his book Heaven. If you never read it, get it. The point is this: you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to get there and be like, oh, I was really hoping it was going to be this way. Whatever you can imagine, it's going to be better. That's usually how, kind of how Randy answers things. He's like, look, it's going to be better. But I will end on this horrible joke. Um, <laughs> when I was in seminary, I mean, not seminary, I was in Bible school, this one kid raised his hand and he basically said, is there going to be sex in heaven? But what he meant is, will there be gender? 
And then he, he was a real bashful kid, and he realized immediately what he said, and he turned beet red. And then I have, like, no shame whatsoever. And I, to absorb his shame, I said, hey, because even the teacher was embarrassed, I said, I would trade in my genitals for wings any day. And so that total distraction... Okay. On that note. Joel, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Right. And thank you to all of you guys for sticking around and hanging out with us. So for those of you girls, we'll see you next Wednesday.